makes life uh, fun and interesting and uh, and is a science fa uh, science fiction I'm not certain what you'd say aficionado is not quite strong enough uh, geek I have no idea what we what we'll call you as a matter of fact but anyway um, I, I you know here I am watching a football game but here I am in sort of the middle of uh, of this thing but I wanted to make certain I'm here you know our university, most universities spend a lot of time and uh, effort studying science fact, right? But why, uh, uh, you know, why would we not uh, uh, study science fiction then if we're always uh, studying science fact? And I think that actually um, um, it's interesting because I've been a great fan of science fiction. I, I, read a lot of it, read a lot of it. And, um, and what I've discovered over time, and this is certainly, I've had a lot of time to discover these things, and that is that um, is the science fiction, science fiction soon becomes uh, fact in so many different ways. And I think, I think it stretches the imagination, lets us think uh, beyond our boundaries, lets us think about things that uh, we would never possibly imagine think about uh, you know you think about Jules Verne's trip to the moon and then here we are we landed in the, we landed on the moon or, uh, or um, you know Frankenstein was it Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and uh, and now we've ended up with all this genetic engineering that's taking place right on our own campus my favorite one though is the Hyperloop you know we just uh, as you well know we just uh, we just uh, snagged the Hyperloop uh, to be both the research and the certification center. And I'm actually going to go out and see the first human uh, ride on the Hyperloop. It's a, it's a pod, travels 700 miles an hour, is to uh, ground transportation, what um, SpaceX is to space exploration. And no one thought that this was possible as an engineering feat, but it is not now possible and that comes from a lot of the science fiction things that we've read so i'm delighted uh, i'm delighted you guys would let me welcome you to this symposium uh which will explore science fiction um uh, not only just as a as a genre but also as a resource for teaching and learning and uh, and certainly research because again as i say uh, so many of the things we think about have come um out of science fiction um, as I've said, science fiction is fun to read and watch, but it's also important to study uh, because it provides a view of the world and, um, and a path to the future. So I'm reliably informed that my dear friend Jay Cole, um, who is a dyed-in-the-wool science fiction fan and is teaching his honors course in, uh, in science fiction. Is that right, Jay? Aren't you teaching an honors course? As a yes, fan? I am. Um, and and so so he tells me and I uh, that uh, that there is a propulsion system in Star Wars called hyperdrive. Is that right? Yes. Well, so the hyperloop and hyperdrive. I made the connection. <laughs> as a matter of fact. So anyway, it's wonderful to see all of you, and thank you for letting me be here. I hope you have a great conference. How long is going? How long is this going on? We're going to run until about five thirty this afternoon. Okay, and then and and. Uh, what are you studying? This is going to be about how to make science fiction more of an academic resource for faculty and students. So, so, you're, so you're actually talking about the pedagogy of it then? A little bit of that, it's, and, it's, it's, and yeah. also the central role that library collections play in that process. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, and I'm glad that the libraries have been sponsoring this. I really appreciate it. So Paula, everyone, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And uh, everyone have a great day. And and I hope we win our football game while I'm at it. <laughs> so you guys have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you, much. President Gee. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Gee. I'm honored to be here. I really am. Well, thank you, President Gee. And uh, that's, that's a great way to, to get us, uh, to kick us off. Um, so we can have a kickoff and so can the football team. Um, um, but we really appreciate uh, his being here and being a part of this and being supportive of, of this endeavor. Uh, welcome to everyone um, uh, to this uh, 2020 Asimov Symposium, uh, sponsored by the West Virginia University Libraries. Uh, we're delighted to be here, and I'm uh, thrilled um, and honored.
to be joined by my colleagues, Stuart Plein uh, and Paula Martinelli, both with the WVU Libraries. The three of us are partners in crime and co-hosts of this event. So uh, delighted to be joined by, by Stuart and by Paula. And uh, you'll hear more from, from Stuart, uh, certainly as, as the program uh, progresses. Paula, uh, you see her there now. She, she's operating a little bit more behind the screen, behind the, the curtain. Uh, but Paula, thank you so much for everything you've done to help pull this event together. You're welcome. I think we have a really exciting lineup, so I'm, I'm excited to be a part of it. Great. Well, speaking of that lineup, um, I'm going to say just a few words about this symposium, the purpose of today's event. Uh, spend just a, a minute or two talking about the previous events uh, that we've held. Um, and then just a little bit about the fact that this is also an event marking the centennial of Isaac Asimov's birth. And once I finish those brief remarks, I'll turn it over to my colleague and partner in crime, Stuart Plein. Um, but let me say just a few words about why we're, we're getting together. Um, and, and by the way, that reminds me, we, we really do wish we were getting together physically, but of course, because of uh, the coronavirus this year, we are doing this virtually, uh, better than nothing, um, but we certainly hope at some point to be able to convene all in one place, um, hopefully in Morgantown at some point in the future. But the, the thinking behind uh, this symposium really stems from a desire to celebrate um, WVU Library's Isaac Asimov collection. And Stuart will talk um, more about that collection in just a moment. Uh, but it really is a wonderful academic resource. It's a wonderful teaching tool, a wonderful learning uh, resource, great uh, research tool. But as President Gee said, uh, I think very eloquently and, and, and put the point very succinctly in his comments, we study science fact at a university, why not study science fiction? Because there's a lot of interplay and there's a lot of, of, a, of an interrelationship or a dynamic relationship between the two, or there can be. And, and certainly if you think about the ways that science fiction, like Frankenstein, I thought President Gee's examples were well chosen. Uh, Jules Verne, um, some of the, the great classic science fiction writers, the way that their works have impacted the development of science, um, attitudes towards science, and the way that science fiction continues to affect public opinion and public attitudes and inspire uh, the next generation of young scientists. All of that makes the, the study of science fiction, I think, a very legitimate area of inquiry for universities. So that's one of the things we hope to accomplish uh, today, to make the case uh, and to share uh, exactly how and why collections like um, the Eaton Collection at the University of California at Riverside, uh, the Asimov Collection here at WVU, uh, how those can be uh, tools and resources for our faculty and our students and for the community at large. Um, another thing we want to do uh, is place this event today in a larger context. And this is actually the third event that we've organized. Uh, the first event was in 2010. And at that point, we were tremendously honored uh, to have uh, Jim Gunn, uh, the founder and the director emeritus of the Gunn Center for the Study of Science Fiction at the University of Kansas, come to Morgantown uh, with his colleague, uh, Chris McKitterick. And Jim did a, a phenomenal uh, presentation on Isaac Asimov, his life and his legacy. And that was really the first event that got, um, got the whole thing started in terms of these Asimov symposia. And we're really honored and delighted to have Jim and, and Chris and Kai Johnson, uh, all three uh, from the Gun Center, join us as part of our discussion today. Um, the second event we had was in 2018. We had a bit of a hiatus, um, but in 2018, uh, we brought our neighbor from across the mountain, um, Andy Duncan from Frostburg State University to campus for a guest lecture on uh, science fiction. He did a wonderful job and it was the beginning of a great relationship and a, the beginning of a, a beautiful friendship, so to speak. So 
delighted to have Andy back with us today um, uh, as well. Uh, and then there's this event today. So this is our third Asimov Symposium. Uh, we're not quite to the point where it's annual or even biannual, but we hope to get that get to that point uh, and to have uh, events on a regular basis celebrating science fiction and celebrating the centrality of these wonderful library collections to the teaching and learning process. Um, the final thing I'll say is about the Asimov Centennial. And um, I'm a huge Asimov fan, have been uh, most of my life, actually taught uh, an honors course here at WVU uh, four years ago on Asimov's science fiction and turned my experience teaching that class into a guest editorial that appeared in Asimov's uh, science fiction magazine uh, in 2017, which was a, a great honor. But I, I've been a huge Asimov fan since I was uh, old enough to read. Um, and uh, it's, it's noteworthy, I think, that this year, 2020, marks the 100th um, anniversary of Asimov's birth. He was born in 1920. Um, not entirely sure what day. I guess there is some uh, Asimov himself um, uh, suggested one date. Um, other other friends suggested a different date, but it was 2020, uh, 1920, excuse me. And so this year in 2020, we celebrate the centennial of Asimov's uh, birth. And he died in 1992, uh, so he's been and gone for uh, for almost 30 years. But his his legacy certainly lives on. And it lives on in events like this, where we can continue to talk not just about him, uh, although that's a, a big part of, of why we're gathered here today, but to talk about science fiction generally and the importance of it um, to our academic enterprise. So with all of that said, um, Stuart, I'll turn it over to you. And if you would um, uh, bring us your greetings and welcome and uh, your opening comments. Thank you, Jay. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're really happy to have you as we celebrate Asimov on this day and on on the year of his 100th birthday. So I'd like to share with you a few comments that I've drawn up about the overview of our collection because you may not be familiar with it. And I'd like to share a little bit about about our collection here. So um, to begin in a collection that includes everything from a tiny 1977 Yolanda Carter Amistad Press miniature book on the original Star Trek series to the scores and scripts in the papers of alumnus Jay Chataway, an Emmy award-winning composer for several Star Trek television series, including The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and Enterprise. The Isaac Asimov collection stands as the foundation of science fiction at West Virginia University. Although Asimov, which we certainly consider as one of the greatest science fiction authors of all time, passed away, as Jay just, just told us in 1992, his work lives on in the WVU Rare Book Room. One of the most prolific science fiction authors of the 20th century, Asimov, Asimov made a huge impact on how we view the future. Responsible for more than 500 authored and edited publications, Many of us can recite the titles of his most popular novels by memory. Foundation Trilogy, The Martian Way, The Stars Like Dust, wonderful titles. Books that were turned into movies include I, Robot, The Fantastic Voyage, and The Bicentennial Man. The novella Nightfall, many would argue, is perhaps Asimov's single most important work. Its popularity led the story to be adapted for radio, film, podcast, and vinyl. They're all here, all in the Isaac Asimov collection at West Virginia University Library. The Rare Book Room and the archives are home to the expansive collection of two major donors, as well as many other gifts from dedicated readers of his work. Larry Shaver, class of 1974, founded the Asimov Real Brook Collection with the gift of his personal rare and fine books and artifacts. After receiving the Shaver gift, the library announced the collection through a small exhibit. This digital exhibit attracted the, the attention of Carlos Patterson from California, who reached out to WVU to offer his personal collection of Asimov material. Both donors continued to contribute over the years, 
Mr. Patterson recently gave an expansive collection of associated Asimov titles, while Mr. Shaver, prior to his passing, donated a fine first edition of Asimov's Our Angry Earth in the original dust jacket. Other donors have also contributed. Eric Wright recently donated Asimov's Election Day 2084, a very, very apropos, we might say, today, along with many other titles over the years. John Frederick gave a signed paperback of The Currents of Space, and we received a collection of Asimov Science Fiction Magazine from donor Jack Stewart. Are curators allowed to have favorites, you might ask? I have a few. For me, as a fan of the original Star Trek television series, one of my favorites is William Shatner's reading of The Psychohistorian, a story from a uh, foundation on vinyl. It's a real classic. And then there's the delightful postcard donated by Dr. W. Jeffrey Hurst. Dated April 10, 1989, Hurst wrote to Asimov to ask if he would write an article for his journal, Laboratory Robotics and Automation. Asimov replied, and I quote, I don't see how on the face of the earth I can help you. I am strictly a science fiction writer working entirely from imagination. I have never even seen a real robot and know nothing about robotics as a science or technology, even though I invented the word. Asimov typed the postcard himself and signed it in blue ink. Priceless. So whether visitors to the rare book room are familiar with Asimov or not, every time someone enters the room, their eyes are immediately drawn to the extensive collection. Thanks to these donors, West Virginia University has one of the largest Asimov collections in the nation, including many rare and signed books. Thank you so much for joining us today as we continue to preserve, to share, to instruct, and to promote the Asimov collection as one of our most outstanding resources. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart, very much. And uh, that provides a, a wonderful context for everything we're doing today and everything we've been doing for the last 10 years or longer. Um, so uh, let me give just a, a quick overview about today's event, uh, and then I'll turn it back over to Stuart, uh, who will tell us a little bit more about uh, Larry Shaver uh, and, and pay tribute to him. Um, after Stuart's tribute to Larry Shaver, then I will have a conversation with Andrew Lippert from the University of California at Riverside about the Eaton Collection of Science Fiction and Fantasy. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, and Andrew, we certainly appreciate your joining us uh, today and sharing, us, sharing with us information about your wonderful collection. Uh, we will then have a conversation between Stuart and uh, a member of an instructor uh, of science fiction and fantasy uh, here at WVU, uh, Kazi uh, Arka Rachman. And we're delighted to have um, instructor uh, Rachman join us for this discussion and talk about his experience teaching science fiction and his interest in science fiction. And then we will have uh, Andy Duncan moderate a discussion with uh, an all-star A-list panel of the Gun Center um, at the University of Kansas the director and founder, um, Jim Gunn, the uh, current executive director, Chris McKitterick, and the current associate director, Kai Johnson. So that's the, the lineup for today. Uh, and again, the theme that brings all of these things together is a love for, uh, an appreciation of, and a desire to promote science fiction as a teaching, learning, and resource tool. And so we'll hear from the Eaton Collection and from the folks at the Gun Center and from uh, Mr. Rachman about how that is all done in three very different contexts. But first, a tribute to uh, the person who in so many ways got the, uh, the ball rolling here at WVU, uh, Larry Shaver. So Stuart, back to you. Thank you, Jay. Um, I worked with Larry for a number of years and I'd really like to take a few moments to remember Larry Shaver a West Virginia native from the nearby town of Fairmont and alumnus who graduated in 1974. The founding donor of the West Virginia University Asimov Collection, Larry passed away only a few short months ago on July 21. He knew that we were planning this, um, this symposium, so it's only right that we should take a few moments today to recognize him. 
In Larry's own words, upon donation of his collection, he said, and I quote, I didn't intend to build a collection. I just intended to read his books. The best way to determine if you already read a book is to have it on the rack. Putting them together, he said, I've had the pleasure of reading every one. But as the collection grew, it seemed such a waste to keep them on my shelf. Already a reader of science fiction, Larry picked up his first book by Asimov in a P Pittsburgh bookstore nearly 40 years ago. He read it, he enjoyed it, and he wanted to read more. Soon he was searching for other books by Asimov. After reading 100, Larry decided to read them all. Yes, all 600 of Asimov's books. Along the way, he added games, audio recordings, videos, VHS tapes, films, board and computer games, a poster, wall charts, and calendars. Well, you get the idea. Larry was a bit of a completist there. Larry donated his collection to WVU in 2003 to much fanfare. The university was very happy to accept such an important collection. By the time I joined the library in 2004, Larry was already legendary. Standing in front of a wall of Asimov's works, I slowly took in the fact that all of these books were the work of one individual. There on the shelves was the Foundation Trilogy I read in college and the otherworldly 1950s graphics of the dust jacket on iRobot. To see the collection and to know that this was, a, was the gift of one individual was very impressive. A few years later in 2010, James Gunn, who has graciously joined us again today, came to WVU to talk about his friend, Isaac Asimov. Larry was there. He traveled from his home in Oklahoma City, where he worked for the FAA for 35 years as an air traffic controller instructor. It was the first time I had the opportunity to meet Larry. We would meet again from time to time over the years whenever Larry traveled back to West Virginia. Thanks to Larry's generosity, West Virginia University has been able to share Asimov's work and life with students, faculty, researchers, and fans for nearly 20 years. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, for nearly 20 years, almost two decades. Today, when a class visits the, the rare book room, one of the things I try to convey to students, many who have never heard of Asimov before, as they stand like I did in front of the wall of his works, is just how ubiquitous, how prevalent, and how important Asimov was in the 20th century, and how deeply his impact is felt today. We're grateful to Larry Shaver for donating the collection he spent decades developing, leaving behind a legacy that allows us to continue to share his fascination with Asimov with others. Our thanks to Larry. Thank you, Stuart. That's a, a wonderful tribute to uh, a very generous individual and somebody who meant a lot to you, I know, and uh, by extension meant a lot to uh, all of us here at WVU. Everyone who's a science fiction fan or who um, has an appreciation for the power of libraries uh, certainly owes a debt of gratitude to Larry. So thank you very much for that heartfelt tribute. One thing um, we'd like to say to those of you who are, are listening or watching is please feel free to send questions uh, by chat uh, if you have them regarding anything that we're talking about during the course uh, of the symposium. We will probably uh, have time sort of official and formal for Q&A at the uh, end of our three sessions, but if something occurs to you in the meantime, uh, please feel free to, to send a question to chat and Paula and Stuart and I will keep an eye on that and, uh, and try to work those questions in as we, as we move forward. 